Good morning. Hello. My name is Vasudha Goyal. I'm from the University of Minnesota and faculty at the American Society of Regional Anesthesia, known as ASRA. And I'm interviewing Dr. Tony Wildsmith this morning. He received the Labat Award in 2002. This interview is a part of the activity surrounding the 100th anniversary of the founding of the first American Society of Regional Anesthesia in 1923 by Gaston Labatt and colleagues. Although this organization is not related to the current day as Rapine Medicine, which was founded in 1975, it has been said that the current society would not have existed quite like it does without the work of Dr. Labatt and the original ASRA. I here welcome Dr. Tony Wildsmith, uh, and it's a privilege to have this opportunity to interview Dr. Wildsmith this morning. Welcome, Dr. Wildsmith. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Dr. Wildsmith has a publication history that covers about 39 years. He started back in the 1970s training in Edinburgh, and he had a focus and knew right away about his interest in regional anesthesia. We'll discuss that more in a little bit. He went on to become an early consultant in Edinburgh, and then um, a consultant in the Edinburgh Vascular Surgery Unit, and subsequently served on the foundation professor in Dundee. Um, I wanted to highlight for our viewers, Dr. Wael Smith uh, started early in his career to focus on regional anesthesia. He studied comparisons of local anesthesia agents, opioids, and sedatives. He went to study in detail particular agents and then neuroaxial anesthesia, spinal, and epidural anesthesia, including complications, and focused on varicity and spread of local anesthesia agents with change in posture. He also studied axillary, brachial, and other nerve blocks, uh, toxicity of local anesthetic agents and allergic responses, including dental anesthesia and sedation. Other subjects that he studied was carotid surgery, ICU care, and the history of anesthesia. After retiring clinically, he continued to work. He was the past president of the History of Anesthesia Society and continues to work with the archive of the honorary archivist of the Royal College of Anesthetists. So to kick off our interview this morning, I would like to ask Dr. Wildsmith, what led you to the, choose the field of regional anesthesia? when I was uh, what you call an intern, a very junior member of the surgical team, we had an operating list with two patients. One was a hernia to get everybody warmed up. And the second was a much more major procedure, uh, an abdominal perineal excision of rectum. When I went back to the ward to see them after the list, they were like chalk and cheese. The patient who'd had the major surgery a general anesthetic supplemented by a high spinal anesthetic was lying in bed as happy as you like, because of course he was still numb from the spinal anesthetic. A patient who'd had the hernia was giving the nursing staff a hard time because he was experiencing considerable pain uh, and having had only a general anesthetic. My immediate reaction then was why couldn't he have had a spinal anesthetic as mm -hmm. well? Uh, sadly, at that time, spinal anesthesia was still under a bit of a cloud in the UK. Uh, and that meant that it was only used in fairly specific circumstances, usually for major surgery when hypotension was required to reduce bleeding. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the reason for the, res, the reluctance, perhaps is the right word, to use um, most forms of regional anesthesia, but particularly spinal anesthesia, was uh, the hangover, and I think that's the right word, from a very major medical legal case in the early 1950s, when two patients who'd been on the same operating list developed um, 
severe neurological complications and sued uh, the hospital and the uh, administrative system uh, for damages. The case ultimately found uh, no negligence because uh, Sir Robert McIntosh uh, helped with a very sterling support to the legal term team uh, with, uh, with the result that the, the lawyers eventually decided that paraplegia, which these patients had, was something that just happened occasionally and that nothing was, no blame could be laid on the anaesthetist. Um, I think most of us these days feel that Sir Robert McIntosh whitewashed the whole situation uh, in defense of spinal anesthesia. And, but although no negligence was found, the, um, the general feeling amongst anaesthetists in the UK was, well, if it can happen occasionally, uh, I'd rather not be involved. And so spinal anesthesia was used very minimally. And, and that, as a result, it applied to other forms of regional anesthesia. The, the other issues which really were a consequence of that very major one was that equipment, facilities for regional anesthesia were not widely available. Now, partially, that was something that was true even in the US in those days. Uh, but when I went to my first ASRA meeting in Orlando, and I think that was about the fourth or fifth meeting, I, I was like a small boy in a sweet shop when I saw all the equipment that was available to my American counterparts considerably better than we had here. So th those, those were the, the main issues. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, the issues of complications continue this day and age. And here in the US, we're sometimes feel, well, our colleagues on the other side of the pond have some extra tools that we don't have available here. So I'm hearing a lot of overlap in some of the challenges we still have today. But what did you see evolve over your career? This is a question I, I've, I've given a lot of thought to, and, and it's, it's quite difficult um, to, to try and think of <clears throat> how things changed uh, as, as we went along, because you don't really notice change at the time. Uh, and I think <clears throat> it was a small group of people in the UK it, from different centers all had the same sort of experience and certainly the same conclusion as I had come to, uh, namely that patients ought to be able to receive the benefits of nerve block. Uh, most um, of the individuals involved here, and I think around the world, were working in obstetrics uh, uh, and uh, that's, that's where um, most of the development took place to start with. Uh, but there were a few like me who didn't work in obstetrics, but still felt that regional anesthesia ought to be available. Uh, and I think what happened was that as we, as we pressed for, for more use of regional anesthesia, as we took on studies uh, to show its benefits or to improve the results for patients, we, we, we looked for better facilities, better drugs, more widely available facilities. Uh, and I think a major, major development, even in my, my career time, was the advent of sterile disposable drugs and equipment. Uh, I, I think if we go back to those neurological cases uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, which had a big influence in the UK, 
as I say, I think Sir Robert McIntosh whitewashed the whole affair quietly, uh, but um, it still stopped people using regional anesthesia. The problem almost certainly was that uh, reusable equipment had been sterilized in a toxic liquid solution, probably a phosphate of some kind. I don't know for certain. And the, the equipment had not been properly rinsed. And, and so uh, some of that sterilizing solution was probably present inside the needles and therefore flushed into the patient before the local anesthetic solution. So nice, sharp, consistent, reliably available, sterile disposable equipment was a big, big change. Uh, and the same applied to um, availability of drugs, solutions for local anesthesia in, in, in sterile packs so that you could be absolutely certain that what you were uh, injecting into the patient was only what you intended to inject. And that with the enthusiasm of a small group of people, better and better equipment becoming available, the thing just snowballed implies a rapid change. It wasn't a rapid change, but it was a slow snowball. Thank you for sharing a keen focus on the benefits and uh, uh, focus to minimize side effects and looking for opportunities that um, development brought, um, probably brought this uh, type of anesthesia available to more people um, as, as your career unfolded. What was your initial reaction to the news that you received the Labatt Award? Wow. <laughs> um, uh, and wow. Um, um, I, 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 I went to not every ASRA meeting after that first one, but I went to most of them. Uh, and through my great mentor, Bruce Scott, uh, I got to know all the people who to that time had previously received the award uh, and when I look back at, at their profiles and how important they were uh, to be bracketed in, in the same way um, in, in award of uh, such a prestigious uh, uh, award uh, was quite something. Um, uh, and uh, I, I still have to pinch myself uh, to be absolutely frank, every now and again, I look at the award list on the ASRA website just to make sure I'm still there. Who do you consider were your greatest mentors over your career? Um, the ones who, uh, the regional anesthesia community will know are Bruce Scott, who was one of my senior colleagues in Edinburgh. And through him, the, the two Americans who I got to know very well, who were both great friends of his, were Ben Cavino and Alan Winnie. Uh, and, and I have to tell you that being introduced before my um, Labatt lecture, being introduced by Alan Winnie was just something else altogether. He, he, he had a very early influence on me because as a trainee, I didn't understand brachial plexus block. It was think of a number and stick a needle there was this sort of seemed to be the, the, the technique that was used. And then he published his papers on the, the, the brachial plexus sheath uh, and particularly the interscalene plexus block and, and indeed, the, the, the very first study I did on regional anesthesia was using interscalian plexus, plexus block to compare different local anesthetics. So there are the three people um, I, I, out there. Um, two others are important. 
Um, the, the anesthetist on that day when I had two different patients was a man called Alistair Masson, very well known in, in the UK, uh, but not really beyond, um, because uh, he, he was of a generation that he was going to use spinal anesthesia occasionally, but he was very keen to have somebody younger trying to spread the word. The, the other person um, was HWC Griffiths, who was the anesthetist who used high spinal anesthesia in Edinburgh for um, the deliberate induction of induced hypotension. Uh, an amazing uh, clinician, a superb clinician. Um, his big problem was that he didn't write things down. Uh, although his then boss, uh, John Gillies, a major figure in British anesthesia as well, did get him to publish his work on induced hypotension. And anybody using spinal anesthesia must read that paper. Very important people. Uh, although not quite as well recognized as they ought to be these days, but important to me. It sounds like you had a very nice team of mentors uh, throughout your career early on from training time. So it highlights the importance of having good mentors to... Uh, they all became friends as well. That was the great thing. I've tried to do the same in my later in my career but the world the world of anesthesia is such a much bigger place now than it was in the 1970s um when, when i was a trainee the royal infirmary of edinburgh had about let me think less than a dozen consultants that's senior staff members now there's about 70 of them Wow. And they don't seem to be doing any more work. Now, a lot more of it, of course, is that anaesthetists are involved in a lot more things now than they were 50 years ago. Uh, intensive care is a major example. Your own area of, of pain management, yet again. But even so, we used to work so much harder then. <laughs> What changes in thinking did you foster during your career? I think the most important thing I did was to study regional anesthesia the way any one who wants to call himself a scientist would. And that was in studies designed to eliminate bias whether it's conscious bias or unconscious bias. So simply doing randomized double bloody, double blinded studies in regional anesthesia uh, was very important. Uh, in, in the area I pursued most in this area, the, the factors that uh, affect intrathecal drug spread, spinal anesthetics. If you go back to earlier days, uh, people would say, oh, I use this particular technique and this is what I do. And that always guarantees a block to, shall we say, T8 and no more, no less. And what they would do is that they would make an injection. They would wait until the local anesthetic spread to T8 and then say, there you are, that's it. Whereas under the drapes, the block would continue spreading higher and higher, but nobody was noticing. Um, and uh, so, yes, starting to do studies double blind, I, I think was quite important. Uh, and on a broader one, I, I like to think that we did actually study things. We, 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 didn't, we didn't accept tablets from Moses' pronouncements from uh, more senior people. We, 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 we actually looked at the issue, defined the problem, and tried to find an answer to it. That sounds just a touch pretentious, but I hope the message has come over. What words would you choose to define ASRA? 
it was, still is, but not quite in the same way, a major leader in the promotion of regional anesthesia methods. Uh, as I said earlier, it was I was like a small boy in a sweetie shop the first time I went to a meeting. And, and that applied not just to the trade exhibition, it, it applied to what was going on in the lecture theatres as well. And <clears throat> under the, 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 the people whose names are well known, the, the founding fathers and so on, um, it, 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 it was a shining example uh, uh, through its educational programs, through the encouragement it gave to others, people like me. Um, it, it, was, it was responsible for the major increase in, in the use and quality of regional anesthesia that there has been over the last 50, 60 years. Um, uh, but a society is, is, is not a, an active thing. A society is the people who are involved with it. Uh, and um, there, there, were some, there were some wonderful people in, involved um, uh, then. And, and now the world's a different place now, of course. Uh, everything's changed, not just region anesthesia, not just anesthesia. Uh, but it, it, was, it was the encouragement in the broadest sense of the word that the society gave to others uh, more than anything else. Um, the journal was important, very important. Uh, I, I only got to know about it when um, it had been going for about five, six years. But a man called John Hinckley, who was the administrator of the society in those days, was, was, was very helpful to me because he managed to dig out all the back copies. Uh, and I, I know I have the only UK complete collection of those early volumes in paper. Everybody can get it online now, but I've got the paper copies. My big problem in life at the moment is that we are shortly going to be moving to a much smaller house. My wife is insisting on downloading. So I've got to make a big decision about what I do with those early 20 paper bound volumes of uh, regional anesthesia. And even the very earliest ones are, make fascinating browsing. We've got a few minutes to fill, just pick it out and see what people were saying, what they were doing. It's a it's a very, very important archive uh, mm -hmm. showing the development of regional anesthesia through those decades. I hope with the um, new technology of storage and um, uh, you're able to keep all of them safe for us uh, younger generations. It, it, it's, it's very interesting, but you don't get the same easy experience trying to read an article online on a, on a PC screen as you do from looking at it in paper. <clears throat> the, the, the danger of paper journals, of course, is you go to look something up in the library and you're still there three hours because you just go from one thing to another. Yeah, at least looking at them online avoids that issue. But that's a great search engine. It's amazing what you come up with. I would like to uh, thank Dr. Tony Wildsmith for joining us for this interview and um, dedicating some of his time to discuss about his career trajectory with all the ASRA viewers. My pleasure. Thank My you pleasure. so much, Dr. Wildsmith. Okay, bye-bye.